So uh, we'd like to start the, uh, the last talk in the morning. So again, a uh, continuation of uh, more material. Uh, the speaker is uh, Laura Klassen at uh, Max Planck Institute at Stuttgart. Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, of course, thank you to the organizers for this wonderful meeting in this even more wonderful place. And as we just heard, I'm going to talk about unconventional superconductivity in Moiré transition metal dichycogenides, uh, which is work done in collaboration with these guys here from Bochum and Aachen, and in particular, uh, Nico and Lennart really advanced or implemented advanced codes that allowed us to go to a high resolution, which as you'll see will be important for what I'm going to discuss. Um, Transition metal dichycogenides um, can also be used as, uh, or can also be used for stacking and twisting, and in that way create new heterostructures um, and study maybe new physics. Similar to twisted bilayer graphene, which I guess it's fair to say really um, brought new momentum to this field when correlated insulators and superconductors were discovered at the magic angle. So that now we also consider these systems really as a platform to study correlated physics. And during the workshop, we've already had the plethora of talks about this very interesting system. Now, as we also heard, um, the Moiré bands in twisted bilayer graphene are kind of special because they are based on a Dirac spectrum. Um, this leads, for example, to the occurrence of this magic special angle where we see the correlated phenomena. And this can also lead to topological bands, at least in the very symmetric limit. Now in um, Moiré transition metal dichycogenides, the situation is um, in that sense a bit simpler because um, the model, we, we know better how to model the Moiré bands. And in particular, it's been suggested that you can simulate the triangular lattice Hubbard model with these systems. And this is what I want to um, briefly sketch how you get this in the first part of the talk. And in particular, um, we've kind of taken this seriously. So I want to show to you what type of triangular lattice mo Hubbard models you can simulate. And then we use that as a motivation for um, what we like to do, namely for studying superconductivity from repulsive interactions, uh, which is something Andre told us yesterday how to do. Um, and if you don't like the focus on superconductivity uh, so much, uh, let me also say that what we did is basically consider competing orders in the Van Hove scenario and how that changes in these new Moiré type um, triangular lattice Hubbard models. Experimentally, there's been also a lot of experiments on these Moiré TMD systems. By the way, I'm, I'm going to use TMD instead of transition metal dichycogenides throughout the talk because it's too long to, to say every time. Um, and so I want to just briefly emphasize a few points uh, of these experiments, of these many experiments that will be important uh, later. First of all, let me mention that in these systems, there's no magic angle, but rather a magic continuum. So there is an entire regime of angles where you get correlated physics. And here you can see this um, as function of angle and displacement field. I think this was for twisted tanks and selenite. And yeah, you see this insulating state appears for a range of angles. Uh, furthermore, what was pointed out in that publication is that there seems to be a um, correlation between this insulating state appearing at half filling and the peaks in the density of states shown here on the right. So um, the Van Hove peaks. Furthermore, um, also away from half filling correlated phases have been reported. Uh, for example, generalized Wigner crystals, which we've also already heard about um, and stride phases. And the point I want to emphasize here that is that this means that interactions of extended range must be important in these systems. So in the um, triangular lattice Hubbard model that we are going to get in the end, we cannot uh, get away with just an on-site interaction. And then as I want to talk about pairing or superconductivity, let me also mention 
following there has not yet been a clear observation of superconductivity in more TMDs, uh, but there was evidence for zero resistance state in twisted tungsten diselenide uh, down here. Um, and here you see the line shapes where the resistance goes to the zero. So as this is not yet clear, this of course raises the question, is superconductivity exclusive to um, these heterostructures based on graphene? Um, or can we also get it in other systems? Um, and then more generally, of course, we are still figuring out if the mechanism is conventional versus electronic. And in this talk, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the theoretical point of view and just discuss what's possible in principle. And I'm going to show you that at least in principle, superconductivity is not exclusive to graphene systems. And I'm going to consider an electronic mechanism. So, um, yeah, we're going to discuss superconductivity within the Van Hove scenario. Um, and the other point I want to say about superconductivity is that if it is unconventional in these hexagonal systems, we are basically guaranteed to get something interesting um, because if you go beyond S-wave, almost all the um, first irreducible representations of the symmetry are two-dimensional. So in other words, this means uh, we would expect mimetic or topological superconductivity if it is unconventional or if it's not as well. Okay, so with that, let's uh, go into the modeling for these more transition metal dichycogenides. Uh, we've also already heard about this um, in a few other talks before, but let me briefly repeat some of the um, facts. First of all, we're gonna have to distinguish homo versus hetero bilayers because there are different types of TMDs. For example, um, tungsten diselenide and molybdenum disulfide. And then as, um, so this means that we can get a moiré pattern like here due to a twist angle, but also in the hetero bilayers without a twist angle um, from the lattice constant mismatch. And then um, as you see, Although from the top they are they form honeycomb lattices. When you look at these materials from the side, they have this basically three-layer structure, and you see that inversion uh, symmetry in plane is broken. So this means it will make a difference if you stack them starting at zero degree, like here, or at 180 degree, like here. Um, and I'm going to call this AA versus AB stacking. So please don't confuse that with AA and AB region within the Moiré pattern. Next, um, let's look at the band structure from the layers we start with. I wanna consider the semiconducting transition metal dichycogenides. So there's uh, gonna be a band gap. For example, here we see the band structure for a single layer of tungsten isilinide. And this band gap will, of course, depend on the exact material, the size of that gap. Furthermore, we'll consider the situation where the valence band maxima are at the K and the K prime point. And then because there's strong spin orbit coupling in these systems, um, there's something what's called spin valley locking, uh, which means that you have a definite spin projection um, inside the valley. So if I'm now sketching the span structure just schematically. Um, that would mean just at the K and K prime point, that would mean that here this highest valence band at K, let's say has been pointing up and then its counterpart at K prime will have um, the spin pointing down. Okay, and with all, and, and it's these highest um, valence band, I should say that we wanna use to start building the Moiré band structure. So all of that um, taken together means that there are differences in the setup for our Moiré bands. Um, and I wanna show you a few examples now. Uh, so first of all, here I'm showing the top and uh, bottom, more, uh, sorry, Brion zone of the single layers with the slight twist. And then here you have the mini Brion zone in the K valley and it's opposite on the other side in the K prime valley. And for the situation of homo bilayer AA stacking, if I um, sketch this band from before, from top and bottom layer, 
um, they will be close to each other, as you see here in the mini Brion zone, both with spin pointing up. Um, in contrast, if I consider a heterobilayer layer um, in AA stacking, the top and bottom layer will have a different band gap. So one of these bands will move down in energy and only the other one remains close to the Fermi level. And then the third situation I want to consider is again homo bilayer. So the energy will be the same, but in this AB stacking, which means that here we have to turn one of these um, by 180 degrees. And now you see that K spin up is close to K prime spin down from the other layer. So these two bands have opposite spin projections, the ones that are close by. Then on top of that, we can of course add, let the layers talk to each other. Um, so we have a hybridization in this first case. Um, uh, whereas in the other two cases, um, this is not as important here because the other band is far away in energy and here because interlayer tunneling will be suppressed due to the spin. So um, the active bands um, near the top of the valence band uh, are quite different in all these setups. And now on top of that, we wanna add the Moiré potential. Um, I wanna start because that's the simplest situation with this heterobilayer IA stacking where we have this um, quadratic band in the K prime and its counterpart in the, sorry, in the K valley and its counterpart in the K prime valley. Um, and here below, I'm showing you the example for tungsten disilinide on molybdenum disulfide without Mori. Um, and you see that it's true what I'm saying, the states from the highest valence band all come from the tungsten layer and the ones from the molybdenum layer are far down in energy. So let's take this um, parabola, parabola and add um, the Moiré potential, which we can, um, similar to what we've heard about in Tristet bilagraphy, expand in inverse lattice constants. Um, what this leads to is that you have to fall back this parabola many times because you enlarge your unit cell real space immensely. Um, and then you get this spaghetti of bands. And if we zoom here, it, zoom in here to the top, you see that indeed the highest valence band, now the Moiré band that has formed is isolated and it has a very small bandwidth. So we can also tune through this band with um, a gate voltage. And it's exactly this band here that's been suggested to be well fitted by um, the tight binding model on the triangular letters plus interactions to get the Hubbard. The effective model, this triangular lattice Hubbard model has an effective SU2 symmetry that is formed by these combined spin valley degrees of freedom from the two um, K spin up and K prime uh, spin up valleys, sorry, K prime spin down valleys. Um, and this is the first uh, simulation that I'd like to look at in the form. Then the next case I mentioned is the homo bilayer AB stacking where we have the opposite spin projections and the two layers basically don't talk to each other because of that. So we end up with a very similar situation. We've just doubled our degrees of freedom, um, which means that now we get an SU4 triangular lattice Hubbard model instead of SU2. And then uh, finally, the third situation I'd like to look at is this homo bilayer AA stacking with the displacement field. It turns out without the displacement field, you can again model this with an SU2 um, triangular lattice Hubbard model. However, if you add the displacement field, it will break that SU2 symmetry. And this, as I'm going to show to you, will allow us to um, change the band structure and in particular, tune the location of our Van Hove points in the Van Hove scenario that we want to study. Okay, so with all that, I hope I could convince you it might be interesting to look into the triangular lattice Hubbard model again. Um, and here I'm showing to you the kinetic energy, the tight binding part with the chemical potential um, in a 3D plot along a path in the Brion zone and as contour lines 
uh, in the miasma. There's a special filling in this um, energy dispersion for the non-interacting bands. It occurs at three quarter hole filling when we start from the top emptying this band. And um, that's the Van Hover filling due to saddle points here in this dispersion, which leads to a peak, a singularity in the density of, of states at this filling. Um, these Van Hover points occur at the endpoints here in the Brignon zone. And because of that, we expect that ordering tendencies will get a boost because of this enlarged density of states, which actually corresponds to a logarithmic singularity. And um, on top of that, at this filling, we also have approximate nesting of the Fermi surface. So we have this almost perfect hexagon. Um, so we do expect competing orders, and this has been studied a while ago. Um, and led to this schematic phase diagram I'm showing here, this function of temperature and filling. Near Van Hover filling, we ex expect a spin density wave with these three nesting vectors, M1, M2, M3, and uh, it's flanked by unconventional superconducting states mediated by particle hole fluctuations um, or spin density wave fluctuations. And now what we wanted to see is how does this picture change um, for these Moiré models that I just showed to you. There is a quick question online. Mm -hmm. So the question is, could you please elaborate more on how we extend the model from the SU2 to SU4 when the stacking is changed? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Thanks. Yeah, I was very quick on this. So. Um, The point is, if we go from the one band here to the situation with the two bands here, to first approximation, we can neglect interlayer coupling because they have opposite spins. The, the one from K value will point up and the one from K prime value will point down. Um, so it's basically really just two parabolas which don't talk to each other. Then you can, in the when you set up the Moiré model, you can, perform a gauge transformation um, to get rid of the twist that makes the um, difference in the peak positions here. So you really have just um, for the one valley, two parabolas on top of each other. And then in energy, they are degenerate with the same two parabolas in the other valley, uh, which leads to these four degrees of freedom. So K spin up from top valley, K prime spin down from top valley, K spin up from bottom and K prime spin down from bottom. And then you do exactly the same as uh, I showed here to this. Um, you add the Moiré potential, just that you start with four degenerate bands and not two. And this is how the SU4 symmetry comes about. Um, no, because they are really degenerate in energy, but you're right. This is, of course, an approximation if you, um, and you, in reality, that will be broken. And I think um, due to the, the first, the largest breaking comes from interactions, which bring it down to SU2 to SU2. Okay, so thank you. Thanks. Um, sorry. Yeah, so. Uh, I was saying that we want to see how this Van Hover scenario for the um, SU2 symmetric Hubbard model with just on-site interaction changes for our Moiré models. And more specifically, because like taking this simulation part seriously, we can really ask um, specific questions with each of these types of Moiré materials. Um, in this first case, as I've already um, motivated in the beginning, we can look at how the situation changes if we include the effect of longer range law repulsions to this SU2 model. In the second case, we can study the effect of having more flavors in our Van Hover scenario. And then in the third model with the displacement field, we can study the effect of um, the Fermi surface geometry and the location of these Van Hover points on the competing orders. And this is um, basically the plan for what I want to discuss next. 
to, to study these questions, what we use is the functional renormalization group, which you can think of as a discovery tool for um, these ordering tendencies. Um, and the approximation, we use in a sense a very minimal approximation, so a truncation, which basically amounts to uh, Wilson Archie. This allows us to calculate the static two particle correlation functions stressed by the interactions. So, if you want to think of it as the effective interaction in the system. And the important point is that we do that in an unbiased and momentum resolved way. Unbiased because in the equation that we use, which is this differential equation I'm showing here, um, we do not only include one of these um, ordering channels, um, but all of them, and importantly, also their feedback onto each other. Um, and momentum resolved, as you see, will be very important for the different states we're going to discuss. The momentum resolution for one of our calculations in the peon zone um, is shown here. So um, with that, let me go through the three models I just um, introduced. First, we have the AA heterobilar, so the SU2 Hubbard model with long-ranged interactions. We take the values for this model um, from the previous papers. They've, they've been estimated. And um, in particular, we take into account long-range interactions up to the third nearest neighbor um, repulsion. Their ratio has been estimated as well. And I'm plotting this here um, as function of the distance for these three interactions. However, in the system, we can tune the overall strength of the interaction, for example, um, by a substrate, which is uh, what we do also in our calculations. So we keep the ratios fixed and vary the strength of the, uh, in our case, nearest neighbor repulsion. And because of that, we're going to study this entire grain range that I'm showing here. And with that, um, let me give you a summary of what we find here, you have a phase diagram as function of this nearest neighbor repulsion um, and the filling. Um, on the bottom, I'm showing the corresponding Fermi surfaces. And we find that near Van Hove filling, we get basically the analog of the spin density wave that I mentioned before, just that our SU2 degree of freedom is now um, a combination of spin and valley. So in that sense, a spin valley density wave. It's signaled by the divergence of the corresponding susceptibility, which has peaks here at the endpoints um, where we would expect it because of the nest. Now, as you see, this instability is very un unimpressed by the presence of this nearest neighbor repulsion, um, because here we have basically vertical lines. In contrast, the pairing instability next to it uh, which is signaled by a divergence of the pairing susceptibility, uh, seems to be stabilized by the presence of this nearest neighbor repulsion. And this is what I'd like to discuss next. So let's take a closer look into this pairing state. To this end, we solve the linear gap equation. Um, and I'm showing the two solutions. There are two degenerate solutions uh, that we find here on the right. Um, the upper plot is along the Fermi surface, so this number labels positions on the Fermi surface, and the lower plot is our data within the entire peon zone. And you see um, that these two these data points for both solutions are fitted well by the second nearest neighbor harmonics of the irreducible representation E2 of the lattice point group C6V, which is a very long um, term to say that we find G-wave form factors. Um, and I'm plotting the G-wave form factors here in, in uh, black, which I think you can see here. Now, these G-wave form factors have the same symmetry as the D-wave form factors, which would be the first nearest neighbor lattice harmonics of this era. So why did the system choose the second nearest neighbors over the first nearest neighbors, choose the G wave over the D wave? And the reason for this is quite intuitive because um, it now does not only need to overcome the on-site um, repulsion, which we are maybe 
kind of used to, which is why we expect something beyond S wave um, very often. But now we also have to overcome at least the nearest neighbor on site repulsion. So the pairing is pushed outwards. And this is why we get the G wave, so the second nearest neighbor instead of the B wave, which would be first nearest neighbor. Now, of course, you could ask, why do you care if they have the same symmetries? I cannot distinguish them. Um, and of course, as I'm posing this question this way, the answer will be, I, I will be able to distinguish them. But for that, uh, we have to look a bit closer in the superconducting state. Uh, because as I said, there are two degenerate solutions. So the ground state will be formed by a linear combination out of the two of them, like this. Um, and then we'd like to know which linear combination is realized in the ground state. And for that, we have to minimize the free energy, which I'm showing here. The free energy must have this form due to symmetry. We have the usual quadratic and uh, quartic terms. And because we have these two fields, the, the two parts of the gap, we also have this additional quartic term. And which um, minimum is realized will be determined by the parameters in this free energy, in particular by the sign of this gamma. And that one we can calculate um, using our FRG data as input. And then we find that gamma is positive. So in the ground state, we want this term to be zero, uh, which happens for a so-called chiral combination. So a G plus or minus IG superconducting state. That um, this is favored has, um, it's maybe also intuitive because this state um, has a magnitude without uh, zeros. So there's no uh, zero if you go along the Fermi surface and that sense we maximize the condensation energy. At the same time, the argument of the states, which I'm plotting here, winds four times if we go once around the Fermi surface. And this might already give you a hint that this is a topological superconducting state. When it um, is formed, it also spontaneously breaks. Time reversal symmetry basically by choosing a winding direction. So by choosing G plus with this G minus IG. Um, and we can classify the topological state uh, by borrowing, for example, um, the topological invariant uh, from skirmion physics when we define this pseudo spin M based on the superconducting gap properties. Um, I, I just like this type of calculation because we can then uh, show nice plots of this pseudo spin, uh, which I'm showing on the right here. Um, and it might be a bit small, but what you basically see is away from the Fermi surface, when the dispersion here is the largest, uh, this pseudo spin will point up or point down. It points up here in the middle and down here in, in the corners. But if we are close to the Fermi surface, so if this term, the dispersion term is zero, um, it will wind in plane according to the superconducting gap properties. And yeah, I'm sorry that the picture is not good enough, but you would see that the spin winds four times if you go around the Fermi surface. So it repeats this phase winding, which is why um, this topological number is indeed four for this G plus IG state, whereas it would be two for the corresponding counterpart of the D wave. So for D plus ID, which means that although they have the same symmetry, they can be distinguished based on their topology. These are different topological states. Um, and this does determine physical properties because it determines the number of chiral edge modes. Um, and this is why we expect an enhanced quantized response in spin and thermal hall conductance, which is determined by this number. Uh, there are more questions in the chat. Okay. Should I answer the questions in the chat now or later? What do you mean independent on anything else? Uh, yes, you put analogy with Skirman, but this is Skirman made of uh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think you can calculate this topological number in a different way. I just, this is the one I chose because it gives nice pictures. <laughs> but it, you know, it, as it is a topological invariant, it does not depend on details of the system. Or since the G plus ID is G plus ID, you have the same symmetry. In principle, you could have a superposition of both. Right. And and then perhaps there would be backscattering at the edges, and perhaps your, your net state is still G plus ID. Mm. Um, I'm going to, so the question was, I, sorry, I should repeat it. Uh, the question is, um, in principle, because they have the same symmetries, these two states can mix, mix which is correct. And um, I'm going to delay the answer for a bit because I have a slide on that. Maybe it's the next one. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, I want to say that the state we found is kind of robust in the sense that we found it for a large parameter regime if we change the hopping values or these interactions. Um, but we also wanted to see if it is robust if we go to stronger coupling, which we cannot really do without within our methods. So the thing we can do is to phenomenologically just add such a exchange coupling by hand and see what it does. And if you do that, the D wave will start to mix in. And I'm showing this here on the bottom. If this exchange coupling is zero, we have the G wave. And then you see that um, the mixing occurs. And for large values, uh, we'll get a nice D wave form factor. Um, then we can again use this data and calculate this topological number. And then we see that indeed there is a topological phase transition between these two. Um, when the this exchange interaction overcomes a critical value. And then we're going to change from this n equal to four to an n equal to two change uh, state. We did not consider the edge states um, so far. So backscattering between them. Okay, so this is uh, what I would like to say about these long range interactions. Um, and then go to the next model that I mentioned, the AB homo bilayer, where we have the SU4 Hubbard model. Um, so now we have the, uh, the tight binding part, just the on-site interactions, so no long range interactions. And we again add this exchange interactions now in the SU4 chain. Um, we also tested the results I'm going to show to you regarding um, breaking of this SU4 symmetry to SU2 by SU2 with uh, different types of Hohn's couplings. And here, the main ordering tendencies we find near Van Hover filling are the following. Um, I'm showing the phase diagram again as function of temperature and chemical potential. Um, now, because we do not have the long range interactions, we have D wave. Um, so these form factors away from Van Hover filling and at Van Hover filling, uh, we now find the change. So instead of the spin density wave earlier, we now find a quantum anomalous Hall state. And this is an interaction induced quantum anomalous Hall state. So it occurs due to spontaneous symmetry breaking, not because we start with topological bands. Um, some people also call this an imaginary charge density wave, and it would lead to um, loop currents in the real space lattice, which I'm sketching here. And the reason why this quantum anomalous Hall state appears now is instead of the spin valley density wave is exactly the enlargement of our decrease of freedom because they, um, as we also heard in the previous talk, they will boost fluctuations of the charge basically via this diagram. Okay, and then finally, the third model I wanted to discuss is this AA homo bilayer, um, where I promised we can study the effect of changing the geometry of our Fermi surface and the location of the Van Hover singularities. Now, the model uh, looks like this. Uh, now, we only have the on site interaction, and the change is actually in the side binding part where we get such a piles phase which occurs due to the displacement field. This uh, phase is between zero and pi over three, has been estimated previously um, for realistic displacement fields. And down here, I'm showing the uh, energy contours 
of the kinetic part for different values of this phase tuned by the displacement field in experiment. Um, I'm showing spin up and spin down for zero displacement fields. They are degenerate and we have the situation I described earlier with this hexagonal uh, Fermi surface at Van Hove filling. These blobs are the Van Hove point. But if we add the displacement field and phi becomes non-zero, this degeneracy between spin up and spin down will be broken. Um, this leads to these points, the Van Hove points moving along the MK direction and at phi equal to pi over six, they will meet at the K point and produce a high order Van Hove singularity. If we then increase the displacement field or this phase even further, they will start to move inwards along K gamma. So for example, for phi equal to pi over three, we end up with this situation. In all cases, as you see, we retain a nesting between the spin up and spin down from surface. Um, and yeah, altogether, this of course leads to a rich phase diagram of different instabilities and potentially symmetry broken phases. So let me try to summarize this in the following. Um, here you see the instabilities we find, it's function of this angle and the filling. And I'm sketching again in very small, um, the different Fermi surfaces. The color code of this plot encodes the type of instability, if it's of density waves type or of pairing type. So red would be density wave and blue would be pairing. And this dashed line follows the location of the Van Hove point, um, where you see that within our recoupling approach, we get the instabilities. Close to this Van Hove location, we get the density wave and then particle hole fluctuations of them can lead to pairing in their vicinity. Now, let me try to summarize these different states to, um, because we change the Fermi surface and the nesting vectors, the uh, wave vector of these density waves will also change um, as will the type of density wave because we break the S2 symmetry. And this is what I'm trying to summarize here. So again, angle and filling in the first plot, the color code encodes the wave vector of the density wave. And in the right plot, the color code encodes the spin-spin correlations. And to summarize these two, if you take them together, we see that when we start at zero in our previous situation, we again have this density wave with the endpoints, which um, leads to three degenerate style places. So down here, then if we go along, we move uh, and we move towards this high order Van Hove singularity, we get a hundred degree spiral with the wave vector of K. And then if we go to really high displacement fields, we'll end up with a ferromagnetic order. In between these uh, wave vectors evolve kind of smoothly and also go to incommensurate situations. In the vicinity, as I mentioned, we find pairing instabilities. So again, let me try to summarize the ones we find um, here with this color code now. Um, the, the broken SU2 symmetry will allow um, singlet and triplet to mix. And the symmetry is such that S and F will mix and P and D will mix, um, which might lead to P plus IP or D plus ID again. And the color code now encodes this. Basically, DP is blue and SF is orange fish. And um, what I want to emphasize is that you basically only have one color on one side of the Van Hove um, point of Van Hove filling. It's either bluish or orangish. So um, this means that, and and as I said. Um, before the density waves, the details change if we vary this angle. Um, but that does not have to seem to have a very strong effect on the type of symmetry of the pairing instability. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the pairing state seems to rather depend on the Fermi surface, um, so on the filling, than on the details of the density wave fluctuations. Okay. Um, and that brings me uh, to the end of the talk. Let me 
quickly summarize what I tried to show to you. Um, I argued that we can use these Moiré TMDs as simulators for different types of triangular lattice Hubbard model, and we use that as a motivation to study the Van Hove scenario in these different cases. For the A hetero bilayer, we studied the effect of longer range Coulomb repulsions, which led to this um, G plus IG topological superconducting state with the higher topological number. For the AB homo bilayers, we can approximate an SU4 symmetric uh, Hubbard model. So uh, we can study the effect of more degrees of freedom, which led to a quantum anomalous Hall state instead of a spin density wave. And then finally, um, adding a displacement field to AA homo bilayers allows us to tune the location of the Van Hove point and the Fermi surface geometry, um, which I showed in the very end. So thank you for your attention. All right, the talk is open to question. Uh, I, I have a question from online. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, hi, so um, I'm Marco Grilli from Rome and uh, I have a few questions which are related, but they are uh, maybe naive, but let me ask them nevertheless. So one thing is that uh, a lot of your uh, uh, scenario depends on this Van Ove singularities. And now I was wondering whether uh, this order could be dangerous for this because it could be lift and uh, reduce this Van Ove singularity. And uh, in whether possibly superconductivity could be a way to oppose this fragility because um, superconductivity could, in some sense, exploit the Vanova singularity and protecting it against uh, disorder. So, whether do you did you investigate this possibility? So, this is one question, and um, another question is related to the um, functional renormalization group approach. Whether there is a feedback on the electronic um, density of state or electronic spectral weight, so the self-energy corrections, namely, uh, in, um, in this, uh, uh, the order you are, in such a way to see whether this uh, broken symmetry uh, phases or these fluctuations can give rise to, again, a lifting of this Vanova singularity uh, in a self-consistent way. And then the last question is whether phase separation could be another issue in this in this regard, because uh, interactions when there are density of states which are very large could rather easily induce uh, phase separation in the system. So these are my questions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, the first one was about disorder. Yes, it will probably smoothen the Van Hove singularity, which will reduce the tendency to these instabilities that I showed. Um, I think probably superconductivity is a bit, as long as we still have the particle hole fluctuations, I would expect it to be a bit less sensitive than the particle hole instability, the density wave itself. Um, what was the second question? I, the FRG, we did not include any self-energy effects, um, just because we wanted to um, look at this first qualitatively. Uh, this can be done and just um, would, so there are also people who develop codes for that. It just takes a bit of time to develop these codes. So, um, but we basically did not study what you asked. Uh, in principle, of course, if the ordered states is formed, it will change, of course, the band and, uh, and reconstruct the band structure. Uh, for the case of the spin density wave, this has been studied um, back in these um, publications I showed before, and it's been suggested that this leads to a, a half metal state at higher temperatures and then to an insulated a chiral uh, combination of the three stripes at lower temperatures. Um, and now the third question is the phase was, separation. Uh, is there, did you check that the chemical potential uh, goes in the right direction when you change the, the, the filling of your system? That the compressibility? Um, 
So I don't think we can really answer that question within our truncation. The only thing I can say is that we did not see any instability in the compressibility. Um, but I think we would have to go beyond this approach to really answer this. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I, I wanted to understand the uh, robustness of the topological superconductivity when you apply it to the real material as opposed to the triangular lattice on the real material. Uh, so there is some weight uh, at the Fermi level coming from chalcogens as well. And chalcogens live on the other sub lattice of a hexagonal uh, motif. Now, uh, in, in, in unlike the triangular lattice, which has very high symmetry, that system will have other symmetries. In particular, it will not have these irreducible two-dimensional irreducible representations because inversion is broken. Now, I wanted to understand how to understand uh, so, so the role of the topological superconductivity in the sense that the, in your model, in the tri triangular lattice model, the two-dimensional irreducible representation is important. In a real material, when you break that, presumably topological superconductivity will be destabilized. But in the, in, 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 in the honeycomb lattice, there is also Berry phases and those very phases might work in the opposite direction, tending to stabilize topological superconductivity. So there's a competition between these two. And I was wondering if, if uh, there are uh, simulations on honeycomb lattices that might shed some light on how these states, topological states are stable. I think, um... So I know at least of other FRG results for the honeycomb letters just for normal graphene. Um, and back then they didn't really look into this uh, G plus IG state, but I, they, they also saw this effect that longer range interaction will tend to favor uh, higher harmonics in the um, pairing symmetry, which I think it's, you know, this is really very intuitive and a quite universal effect. The question is if it wins in a real material. Um, we did not look into that. The other, the other layer of your question was about these other states, which is why I put this up again. Um, I think, so on, on this scale of a single layer, they seem to be close um, to this highest valence band that I discussed, where we form, from which we form the triangular lattice. Um, however, on the scale of this effective band, they are probably far away in energy. So I don't know if they would play a role. Um, the situation changes, of course, when you start adding the displacement field and um, you start moving all these spaghettis around. Uh, and yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. All right, next question. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the first uh, part of the talk about the G plus IG with the extended uh, Hubbard, so have you studied how sensitive the, the symmetry of the final state is to the range rather than just to the strength? Yeah. Meaning if I were to just chop off third nearest neighbor or second nearest neighbor, whatever it was, or vary the, the, you know, the relative strengths between them a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we did study that. Um, so the minimal model basically you can come up with is just adding the uh, nearest neighbor repulsion. Um, we also varied the hoppings a bit and, um, and, and the, as I said, the ratio we kept fixed with the tail um, and then studied this great range. But if you really chop them off, you, the, the most drastic thing you can do with still keeping the essential ingredient of the, um, the standard interaction is this nearest neighbor Hubbard model that I'm showing here. And then we get the phase diagram uh, that I'm showing on the bottom. You do get the same effect at large values of these, or not large, but large share values of the nearest neighbor repulsion. So these triangulars of the G wave instability for small values. Um, and this is actually known from previous studies. You do get different types of pairing instability. So I wave superconductivity has been discussed, which is a bit fragile in our calculations um, and F wave superconductivity um, on the side where you have pockets, 
because that can compete because the nodes of the FAs are not on the firm service. But all this, you know, this um, richness goes away if we add the um, repul nearest neighbor repulsion, then it's just G wave. That's why I'm saying it seems to be kind of robust. I guess I was wondering about the experimental situation. So no superconductivity has been found in any of these systems, right? And you think, what are they doing wrong? You have a suggestion? <laughs> well, you shouldn't ask the theorists about that, right? <laughs> no, I've, I've, asked, I've asked experimentalists and what they are telling me is that we are kind of spoiled from the graphene systems. I don't know if you can- But people are trying that. this system, right? Right, but so apparently the problem is contact, contact uh, and maybe disorder. So maybe we'll see something when the samples get better, but um, yeah. I don't know, of course. So what are the phases that has been seen? They, they found these anomalous fault states, right? Oh, the, yeah, that depends on the model. The they found stuff. very, very different um, yeah. types of, the yeah, they, the weakness states, the mod insulator at half filling, um, stripe phases. Uh, so in that and sense, you find these system. also in your calculation? Um, so we are, we are different in a different coupling regime because that's why I had, uh, said let's add a substrate because our method is um, not valid for this type of strong coupling situations. Um, yeah, so in that sense, we did not study this. I get precursor. I think precursors would probably be some type of charge density base, but we didn't go to this. And then we, so let me emphasize again that at least this drop in resistance was seen. <laughs> For this we're gonna yeah, uh, quick theoretical question. Is pair density wave an option here or stiffness prevents it all the time? Um, for most situations, we don't see it, but there is, um, it is an option in this last situation. And there's a paper by Hong Giao about it. Uh, I'm trying to remember at which angle it occurs. I, yeah, I don't want to say something wrong, but there is an option. Oh, oh, probably it's, oh no, I know. It's probably at the situation where you have the high order and hold point. Um, and yeah, there, it, I think it's even, it's degenerate with the zero wave factor um, state. And they had an argument why you might push the pair dense curve. All right, just one more question. Uh, I have a question about uh, after uh, the six of them uh, uh, form three higher order one of singularities, and then uh, with further uh, change, they start moving towards the center, right? Um, can, is it possible to make them meet in the center and then what happens? Yeah, this actually happens if you go to um, phi equal to pi half. Um, so you, you might notice that where we have the high order, um, this, um, this the critical scales as well as the range of the instability are kind of bigger, and this also happens up here. Um, and the reason is that at sorry, this is very small, but at phi equal to pi half, um, maybe you can see it here. We only have a single Van Hoff point at gamma. All right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, just a small question by on that graph. So you mentioned that there's some incommensurate uh, wave factors that develop. Do you think that uh, your model encompasses all the relevant terms or could those be broken down to commensurate situations um, from some other interactions in, with the Moiré? Um, ah, yeah, so, so what we do is really just the instability analysis. So I think they, 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 in that sense, so what we find is the incommensurate um, that could change if you go beyond this, yeah. Okay, so if there is no other question, more important than the lunch, then I think I'm gonna close this session. Thank you so much.